Oh, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Of course, you know, I'm representing here the Economic and Social Committee, that means civil society organizations. I have heard in the preceding panel that the attention was focused on this important uh, actor. So we have social actors and all organizations of civil society. In, in Europe represented in this important uh, consultative committee. And you know the, the strong interest, of course, that we have uh, in this uh, matter. Uh, global power to 2030. Uh, I only just want to excuse because reading the title, uh, Shaping the Future in a Fast Changing World, it's quite difficult for an Italian and uh, <laughs> someone coming from the South. I'm referring to the fast changing. I'm a little bit flexible, but I hope I will do my best. So I will try to avoid to speak so much and to profit of uh, the presence of very distinguished panelists. I will introduce them. Uh, you have uh, Shada Islam uh, on my left. This is the director for Europe and Geopolitics, Friends of Europe. Then uh, we have uh, Madame Berenice Guillaume-Richard, she is a lectureship in contemporary international history at King's College in London, specialist on Southern Asia and the Indian Ocean. Then we have Mr. Popovsky, uh, here with us is the Deputy General Director for Neighborhood Policy and Enlargement Negotiation in the European Commission. And uh, uh, finally, we have also Mr. Uh, uh, Nicolas Mel. He co-founded the Future Society in 2014. Uh, now it's uh, including the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Um, what's uh, the main topic? Uh, we will uh, try to analyze what opportunity, opportunities and risks arise from the, this rapid advance of technology. What about uh, the fact that uh, Europe lags behind both the United States and China in crucial cutting edge technology such as uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning? So what consequence? What are the economic implications? We have heard in the morning that global power has shifted in the past decades. How should the European Union respond? How can the European Union develop a constructive partnership uh, with both emerging powers and the long-standing allies? Uh, what are the prospects for global governance? Uh, these are the very deep questions. So are we moving from a rules-based order to a strong arm uppermost world? Or anyway, how can the European Union defend and strengthen multilateral institutions. And finally, what other global issues demand action today in order to avoid the problems tomorrow? Let us start with our very first uh, round. I will ask, uh, I, will make a little, I will pose a little question and then I will ask our panelists to respond for three, four minutes each, just to give a first picture. So I will start with Mrs. Islam. Um, so, Ms. can the European Union be the guardian of multilateralism and the rules-based international order? Can you just give us your... Thank you very much. Uh, very simple question. Thank you yeah. for putting that to me very early on. So, uh, let me just give you a few thoughts. Um, the order, as we knew it, uh, is already fraying, has been fraying for some time. I mean, one of the obvious uh, illustrations of that is that we haven't had a WTO agreement for like donkey's years. So it was already in, in bad shape, uh, not just on trade, but on other issues as well. Now it's uh, what I call the simple ABC of today's world, which is actually driving it into uh, an abyss. A, America first. B, Brexit, uh, C, rising China. 
A, America First has actually, you know, the focus being on what's their interest, what they can get out of it, it has destabilized the world and destabilized our order, the one we had got used to for 70 years. The anchor, if you like, is gone. Brexit, obviously, the European Union is, is working its way through it, but it has and I think we have to be quite honest about it, has created confusion and chaos uh, uh, in the world about what is Britain going to be like, but also what's the EU going to be like, EU 27. And rising China, I don't have to tell you, see for China, how that is testing and challenging us on many, many fronts. So we have this ABC. We have a world where we have to compete and cooperate at the same time. So we're going outside our comfort zone. And I'm sure you've heard this before during the wonderful day and a half you've had. Now, your question uh, is, is very, very valid because I think it's not just in Brussels that we're asking it. It's being asked, and I can tell you through my travels in Asia, it's being asked very much in Asia. We had it, uh, we had a two-day China-Europe forum, and that question was very much on the agenda. So my answer is, the short answer is yes, Europe can. And the long answer is yes, but not alone. Europe can't do it alone. Nobody can do anything alone anymore. I see Bridget laughing. laughing. Um, so what does that mean, you can't do it alone? And that is going to test us, right? Take us really out of our complacency. We'll have to rely on partners which are not like-minded. They don't think like us, they don't have our values, and who have been asking for some time, very, very rightly, it was asked just yesterday by a Chinese scholar, whose rules are these going to be? So we'll have to work to co-design and co-craft, co-fashion, if you like, a new order. It's going to be a challenge for us, it's going to be a challenge for them, because it also means, I mean, China, India, and others have also got used to this order, benefited from it, God knows, very, very much. But then you have to reshape it. So what I foresee is very difficult conversations, very inconvenient truths coming out. But we'll have to work our way through it, because if we don't have something that binds us, even if it's looser, even if it's more compartmentalized, so I see clusters and clubs of people working together, what Natalie Tocci calls constellations, uh, and I think we will have to work on issues like climate change uh, with, with China and India, because now the U.S. is in retreat. We'll have to work on WTO reform, uh, looking at areas which are very difficult for China, because China is the reason we need a WTO reform. But we can begin as we are doing with the appellate body, the, the, the arbitration system, and then we'll have to take it from there. So my three minutes are up, and I'm just going to say this will challenge us. It will require a different mindset, and that, as we all know, is the most difficult thing in the world. Thank you very much. We will go deeper in another second round. Let me just change and have a, we will have a very fast input. Uh, so please be ready to react because there will be space also for some questions or your consideration. Mr. Mehel, to remain strong, does Europe need to rethink its approach to innovation and digitization? Well, obviously, yes and no, and more yes than no. Uh, the revolution of artificial intelligence is a story of concentration of wealth and power. This session is about power. Overwhelmingly, the, the, the power of Europe is dwindling across the world. And the AI revolution is probably going to reinforce that within the digital revolution, creating what we're seeing now, which is the emergence of a duopoly, between China and the US, driven by network effects and scale effects. And so we really need to ask the right question, which is how do we in Europe reach scale, industrial scale in terms of digital? And the ways in which we do that are difficult because, let's face it, the European project, excuse the provocation, but the European project is a project in castration of power and surrendering to our American allies. How do we recover from that, partially? How do we realign our alliance in a way that lets us go for powerful positions? Uh, that's not going to be easy, that's a cultural shift, and I want to acknowledge the fact that a lot of the things that the Commission are doing uh, through DigiConnect to think through digitization and plan for the AI revolution are good. They're very good, I would not disagree with those. Uh, Obviously, we need to do a lot more to, number one, integrate our digital market. Right now, the digital 
single market is, a, is an aspiration. We need to deliver on that, and boy, it's really, really tough, and it's going to remain tough. Second, on that foundation to reach scale, we need to confront our capitalistic problem. We don't have a problem in innovation. We don't have a problem in techno-scientific excellence. We do not have a problem in entrepreneurship overall. We have a problem in scaling and scaling business models more than technology. We overestimate the role and the impact of technology. We underestimate the role and the impact of business models. And last but not the least, vis-a-vis uh, -vis innovation, I think we really need to find a way to create a European equivalent for DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, but in a way that hunters or imaginary. We do not have national security, like the Americans or like the Chinese, to further massive public subsidies and techno-scientific revolution. We need to invent other imaginaries, such as ecology, such as the ecological transition, and on the innovation side, that is really something that we need to do to be able to disrupt models in the future and balance out the need to catch up with the Chinese and the Americans, and when it's ripe, to leapfrog and go beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let me run, uh, looking at the time. Uh, Mr. Popovsky, is European influence in international affairs declining? What needs to be done to maintain Europe's international reach? Thank you. I guess it's relatively declining, uh, but it's not a reason to give up. Um, and coming back to the more general um, uh, question that you asked in the beginning about the, uh, the uh, defending of uh, a rules-based order, I think it, it's an imperative for us. Because that's what we stand for. I mean, we may be the last man or the last woman standing, but, but so be it. That, that's fine. And, and I think that uh, otherwise, just think of an alternative. Either we have a rules-based order or, or, or it's just, just Hobbesian disorder and chaos and dog-eat-dog. We don't want that. Um, and then there are many related work trends, trade, uh, climate change, uh, international justice, which we've always supported. Um, climate action, uh, human rights. Uh, and so w we need to stand for exactly that kind of, of values because that's, that's also what defines us. And it's important to defend this European way of life. Hmm? I mean, the fact that so many people want to come to Europe, for instance, doesn't mean they want all to be like us, but they are attracted by a certain way of, uh, way of life. Um, um, more generally, um, there was this book about, uh, by, by Moises Naim called, called the, um, the End of Power. And then he spoke of, he wrote about three different revolutions, the more revolution, the mobility, and the mentality revolution, meaning people feel more empowered. They want to change their life now. Um, uh, they also understand the world much better than they, the, the, than, than they used to. But what they all want, regardless of race, race religion, cultural background, is, is justice and dignity. And they also look to Europe for exactly that. We are an embodiment of a, of a, of, of a community based on, on, on very uh, principled uh, um, uh, values. So what we need to do, uh, and I agree we cannot do it alone, is to go against the revisionist trends. Those who are calling into, uh, putting into question the whole international system, it may be imperfect. But again, what's the alternative? Um, so I agree that things need adjustment. We need to, to, to be up to speed. There was this recent French initiative to develop a new uh, international law framework for cybersecurity because the existing body of international law that's based on the Hague and Geneva Conventions may not be enough. Fine, but it's not going against what we already have. We are just trying to adjust to the speedily changing world, and certainly European Union should continue playing a key role in that regard. Thank you. Thank you really very much. We will go deeper in the second round, but... Uh... Now let me jump to India. Uh, Ms. Kyo, how important is India as a global player? Will it become a, a more important partner for Europe? Well, 
Um, the short answer is um, India actually has been um, a crucial player on the world stage for a very long time, in fact, for most of its history economically. Um, it is an even more important power today in many ways, and it will be increasingly important. And the catch to that is that I don't think we've been paying enough attention. So what do I mean by that? Um, well, I'm sure a lot of this is actually familiar, but um, India is currently, of all the, the world's major economies, uh, the uh, fastest rising economy. Um, it is already the third um, consumer of oil worldwide. Its demand for oil is likely to uh, be the key driver in oil markets uh, now that China is slowing down. Um, it's also a key driver in terms of financial systems, for example, with its demand for gold. Uh, and that's just one of the many ways in which the Indian economy, I think, and the way it's going is going to be a crucial factor uh, in the world. Um, geopolitically as well, um, it's a country that draws on a long tradition partly in inherited from the British Empire, which means that it has wide geopolitical interests um, from the Persian Gulf to the Indian Ocean uh, to um, Southeast Asia and beyond. Um, it has uh, played a huge role, and I think it still has a residual idea of itself as a leader of non-Western nations, and that's inherited from the fact it was one of the first uh, major countries to decolonize uh, after the Second World War. And now I think it's questioning its role uh, and where it wants to be. And there's a very clear sense that India wants to go further, wants to be a major power. Um, there's a question as how it will do so. Um, and with what sort of relationships it will do so, including the European Union. But I also think we need to think beyond these, I think, more um, commonly uh, discussed uh, issues around India. I think the other thing I would emphasize for one thing is um, the fact that when we talk about democracy, and we've been talking democracy a lot in this conference over the past two days, um, one of the things that will make, I think, democratic values stand up is whether they actually can thrive and can deliver also economic wealth and prosperity and social safety nets, uh, not just in Europe, but in uh, emerging countries and developing countries. And here, India can be a barometer of democracy. It's the largest democracy in the world, and the health of this democracy is, I think, alongside with what the EU has to propose, going to be a big uh, factor in... Uh, maybe making uh, different countries around the world who face the challenge of development uh, and climate change um, see whether democracy is something that is workable. And the final thing I would say, since I mentioned climate change, is uh, that India will probably not just be one of the main drivers in our ability to fight climate change, uh, whether it manages uh, to transition to renewables uh, is going to be key. It's one of the main markets for renewables in, uh, right now. But there's a sense that it could still be largely driven by coal in terms of its energetic uh, consumption and needs. Um, and it's also going to be probably, I would say, one of the world's uh, first major countries to be directly affected by the destabilizing potential of climate change. Uh, when you look at the impact of climate change, it doesn't affect all regions of the world equally. And South Asia in general, the region of, in which India is central, for better or worse, is really going to be one of the most affected places and is already one of the most affected places. So these things, I think, are going to drive India's importance and there will be lots of challenge for India to tackle if it wants to realize its ambitions, which are very clear and very important. Thank you. Thank you for this first page picture. Now, we have a uh, next 20 minutes, so five minutes each. Uh, let's try to give us uh, some other suggestions. Uh, Ms. Islam, how can Europe improve its ties with uh, Asia? Um, I can also ask where you can interact, but we have to respect the time. Please, Ms. Okay, so for many countries, thank you very much. So for many countries in Asia, I, I take ASEAN, the Associated of Southeast Asian nations, uh, uh, Europe is already, uh, I wouldn't say a model because they don't use that term, but it is an inspiration. And we are actually, as Europeans, helping ASEAN in many, many things, creating their uh, economic community. So we're already helping and we're responding to what they want from us. 
going forward, I think there are several things we can do, and I think the one thing that I hear all the time from my Asian colleagues is help us to not have to make a binary choice between U.S. and China. Help us to stay out of the fray. Stop talking about dead Greeks. The Thucydides, um, I was going to say crap, but Thucydides is a trap. Uh, help us stay out of it. Uh, and I think what, the way we can do it, sorry, I shouldn't have used that language. Um, the, the way that we can do it is not fall into the containment uh, strategy that Mike Pence was peddling while he was in uh, Asia at the moment. And one of the things I heard, which was really interesting, is APEC obviously didn't get its final communique. And uh, a colleague of mine from China actually said, well, that was because the Europeans weren't there. The Europeans are seen as, as, as figures, as people uh, who are willing and able to compromise. And Mike, Mike Pence's tantrums across Asia really didn't do him any favors, or the US any favors. And then they have, I'm sorry to use that word as well, a very bullying China. So they find themselves between a rock and a hard place, and where Europe can help, actually help itself as well, to stay out of this, this trap that is, is out there. Now, more specifically, I would say pay more attention to what we have, which is the Asia-Europe meeting, ASEM. It is a very useful tool that we have. It's always lived under the shadow of APEC, but I think the last meeting that was held here in October was proof that Asia and Europe can come together on very powerful issues, including saving the multilateral order. Give ASEM a more powerful emotional narrative, okay? Um, continue with the trade agreements that we're doing. So we've got to deal with Singapore, Japan. Let's pursue it with other countries. L let's bolster uh, ASEAN. ASEAN is also uh, facing very existential problems. Uh, democracy declining, populist pressures, uh, ethnic dissent. Uh, this is something that we're familiar with also, so we can help there as well. Uh, do a deal with India or, for God's sake, stop doing a deal with India. But we cannot keep going, you know, what is it, 12 years now or so. Uh, let's make up our minds about that. Um, I think on security, the, the last Asia security paper that came out from the EU is very good. It outlines many, many areas where we can interact in Asia and outside Asia, but it has also provoked a bit of confusion. Uh, confusion being, so what's going to happen? Is, uh, are we also going to be a hard power? What kind of a power are we? And I think we need to uh, actually clarify what this means. What Asia likes from Europe, of course, is a traditional non-traditional security. So they like, they like that because they see us playing uh, a, a soft power role. I don't like that word, but I think that is what Asia has got used to. My final point, and this is actually almost a plea, uh, please don't turn away from civil society in Asia. This is something that is really a problem at the moment across the region. Civil society is being squeezed uh, by the populace, the hardliners who are learning very quickly from uh, the White House, uh, and actually replicating that, already doing it before, but now doing it even more forcefully and knowing that there is no uh, going to be no sanctions when they do that. So what are we seeing? We're seeing the women's movement in trouble uh, in many parts of the world, uh, also because of Saudi influence, let's be very frank about it, not just, uh, not just the populists on their own, but also the radicals. We're seeing journalists being squeezed, so the, the voice of, of independent press that still existed in countries like Pakistan uh, is being really silenced um, by the populists and the army taken together. We're seeing uh, ethnic, ethnic minorities being persecuted even more, and I don't have to tell you where, we all know it, across the region actually. So I think if we were to become really engaged with civil society, we need to actually invest in our delegations, European delegations in Asia. We need to make them more listening posts. They really need to interact, especially with the millennials in Asia. They have to go to universities. They have to be a kind of a force, security foresight. Um, uh, antennas picking up, picking up across the Middle East, but also in Asia, what's really happening, and not just behave as traditional diplomats. The time of traditional diplomacy is over. Europe, if it's going to up its role in, in Asia, really needs to act as beyond diplomacy, and that means interacting with civil society in a very bold manner. Thank you. Thank you so much, also for respecting your five minutes. Now, jump again to Mr. Mav. 
Can Europe provide a middle way in which uh, technological development is turned towards sustainable innovation, offering broad-based prosperity? Well, thanks a lot, you see. It's a great question. I hear great words. Aspirationally, sustainability, middle way. You know, it is meant to seduce us as Europeans, as it should. And it will probably, um, but I have a few caveats I want to put. So the short version is, yes, and you know what? We have no option. So we'd rather go in that direction. But the first caveat I want to put is that we have had, uh, during the Cold War, times change, of course. I don't want to you know, copy and paste, but we have seen where the non-aligned movement has taken Egypt, Yugoslavia, and other luminaries, including India. I mean, part of, uh, uh, it's, it's a bit of a provocation, but India has failed originally to take off economically vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China. I wouldn't say it's because they were part of the non-aligned movement, not of course, but I just want to say that middle way at a time of polarization is uh, palatable, but potentially dangerous. Uh, the fact that a bit like the non-aligned movement, uh, the European Union is and remain an exercise in transnational governance, uh, you know, explains why I want to bring a caveat. That said, I think we have no option and we should really move towards that. And there are a few things that we really need to do uh, if you want to do that. Yes, we can leverage our values to create on the long term uh, a market that serves the customer base. But at present time, ethics doesn't pay. There is no market for privacy. There is no market for ethics. This is something that we need to create. This is something that the GDPR is pushing down the throat of customers. I think it's good. I think this is an occurrence where the law is not lagging behind. This is an occurrence where the law is throwing a huge challenge to engineering. And I think it's a great thing. But for us to create the conditions of a market where privacy and ethics pay off, we need to articulate a few things within GDPR, at the core of which we find this beautiful principle of data portability. Yes, it's a way to lower down the barriers of entry for all industrial houses to question the monopolies and oligopolies of the world. But for that to happen, we really need to catch up. We, and we really need to articulate an industrial model of API economy where de facto, in principle, portability of data from small players to bigger players can work. Otherwise, what may happen is that four or five years down the line, the European Court of Justice will strike down this principle or render it void. We need to bring meat on the bone for this to serve as a linchpin of catching up. Um, and probably my final point is Africa. If we know that if we don't help Africa develop, we Europeans are going to face uh, growing flows of migrants. Mm -hmm. We know that the tolerance for migration is getting super low in Europe. We know that digital economy is a great purveyor of development in Africa. If we don't step into the geostrategic game and break down the duopoly between China and the US in Africa, and we can offer a lot uh, to help Africa move beyond this, uh, let's say, geostrategic cyber colonial uh, paradigm that is building up in Africa, if we don't do that, we are going to hand over our destiny vis-a-vis -vis migration to the US and China. And there is a lot that the European Union can do to convince the African Union and African countries that we can bring other stuff rather than cyber colonialism. Yes, France, yes, the UK, yes, Italy, yes, Spain, have in the eyes of Africans, in a way, this colonial eye. Okay. I don't think that the European Union, as a project in castration of power, carries that. I think that this is an immense market for Europe, and I think that influence and technological transfers and industrial collaboration can translate into market share. And by doing that, uh, we would regain, uh, in a way, control over one of the biggest challenge of the current century, which is the fact that demographic explosion will translate into probably increasing flows of, of migrants with our tolerance going down across the continents. Thank you. Um, 
Now, Mr. Popovsky, you are in a very particular observatory from your point of view, the question of the questions. What are the biggest foreign policy challenges for European, facing the European Union? I'm afraid we share these challenges with others. Um, so I could, I could come up with a long list, but that's not the point. Um, I, I think, first of all, um, um, and that goes back to the, um, one of the messages of President Juncker in this house, um, we need to project stability and we need to provide for stability and security of our own people. That's what people expect. And that requires a lot of things because, uh, as we know, the very concept of security has evolved a lot. Security is not only about the hard power and the armies, and the, uh, it's much more, more than that, and, and that's what uh, the European Union has been developing, that approach to security policy. Of course, we must not ignore uh, the hard power, the military mind. I very much agree with you that we need to streamline uh, the industrial bases, the way we procure, the way we develop our capabilities. And you know, when you look 10 years back, it was almost inimaginable to think that the European Union would start investing EU money into military research and development. That is going to happen now. I mean, it is happening already now. It will, and, and, and there is more to come after 20, uh, 20, 21. So uh, no, these days there is talk about the European army. Uh, but that's not, uh, that's not for tomorrow, but we need to lay foundation for the, for, for the European Union that can protect. And then also project stability into, uh, well, our immediate neighborhood and beyond. Our imme immediate neighborhood is, uh, is my area of expertise these days. There we, we have become uh, a force to, to, be, to be reckoned with. We are not imposing things. Uh, we try to do things in, uh, in, in partnership. Um, uh, when it comes to uh, migration management or to joint work on climate change and things where we need to be joined up in order to be able to, uh, to obtain uh, 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 results. Um, clearly there, is, um, there are links between external threats and internal threats, we all know that when we talk about uh, the fight against uh, terrorism for instance. Um, this is uh, this is transboundary, transnational. A lot of it is homegrown, um, uh, so it is a challenge, both internal and external, and it is there uh, there to stay. But I will come back to what I said in the in the introductory remarks that we need a clear set of rules to deal with these challenges. The shooting from the hip is not good enough. We want to be predictable for our own people. Uh, we want to be predictable and, and do things by the book uh, when we engage uh, with partners outside Europe. Thank you. I am really hoping you are collecting uh, questions uh, and observations, considerations. Um, back to Berenice Gio Richard. Finally, what are the possibilities for a deeper European Union-India relationship? Um, if I can start off by actually responding to uh, something Shada mentioned, because in the spirit of conversation, um, I actually agree that there is a danger of reading what's happening in Asia in terms of containment and of going with the current narrative emerging from the US government right now. Um, and specifically when it comes to India, what you mentioned for ASEAN, I think would hold true as well. Um, containment, uh, first, I don't think is the answer for the EU, vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, but I also think containment is not something that India will fall for. Um, it is, it would be dangerous um, right now and in general for India to adopt this containment strategy towards China. But also there's a very deep um, mistrust of logics of blocks and alliances that um, India might see as an entrapment historically. And this is non-alignment again. Um, there has uh, been water under the bridge since the days of non-alignment, although it still exists technically. But I think that instinct, despite historical change, despite the end of the Cold War, uh, despite changes of regime in India, stays on. And so there is a deep mistrust in India to any formal and sort of long-term or sort of a, a 
tight bounds type alliance um, on India's part. It's also a country that, if you look, tries to uh, prefers bilateral ties and in issue specific uh, engagement very often. So to come to the EU, then, I think this is probably where I see the India-EU partnership going. Um, just a few days ago, there was this announcement um, that uh, the EU is, is seeking such a stronger partnership. But I think we need to think in terms not um, of alliances, uh, but rather of issue-specific um, priorities, where both India and the EU can find common ground as priorities that benefit um, both of them, and where they can come closer. So what might these be? Uh, well, the one uh, I uh, mentioned, first of all, in, in my think piece, and which I was happy to see is actually part of the announcement uh, um, in the EU uh, paper on India recently, is uh, a common uh, engagement to fight against climate change. And here I think uh, India and the EU have a lot to learn from one another. Um, in terms of building uh, eco-friendly infrastructure, managing the challenge of urbanization. Um, for India, the challenge is particularly, uh, particularly pregnant because it's a country where still two-thirds of people live um, you know, uh, in rural areas. And uh, cities, whether megacities like Delhi and Mumbai or smaller cities um, all around India, are booming very rapidly. And the question is going to be, how do you plan them so that they are resilient, they, are, uh, they work for growth and for society, but they are also sustainable. And I think here um, there is, uh, I think, in terms of the EU experience with living in high-density environments and trying to figure out how to build sustainable cities, come on ground, um, which also actually, I think, means going back to the past. I mean, we talk a lot about technology in this conference, and I think we can also think of technology as something that's not necessarily brand new, um, but that can also draw on the lessons and traditions of the past. I have a colleague at King's College London called David Edgerton, who's a historian of technology, and uh, wrote a book called The Shock of the Old. A lot of the things that work are not necessarily coming out of nowhere. They're often building and adapting and experimenting with things that have been there for a long time. So what might that be? I think this, this could be uh, things like taking uh, real notice and doing real research into um, indigenous tr traditions in India in particular, but in, in general across the world, uh, in fighting environmental change. India is a country that has fought environmental change and has thrived, in fact, on adapting to climate change and environmental change throughout its history. Right? It's a subcontinent that is environmentally extremely changeable, much more than ours, which means that Indian societies have actually been extremely good historically at inventing ways of coping with extreme climatic environmental uh, pressures. Aridity, extremely hot temperatures, uh, floods, massive rivers changing course, cities having to move almost overnight, uh, because a, a river the size of the Brahmaputra, which I think is one of the top rivers in the world in terms of its uh, power, uh, you know, shifting course uh, completely uh, in the space of a fortnight. This is a country that knows how to adapt, actually. And there is know-how here that we can tap into for India's benefit, but also for ours. And I would say maybe this is where we should do in general. So that's climate change. The other thing, um, more to come back to the issue of power um, is how should India and the EU uh, react to uh, China and particularly to the BRR initiative because this is a question that both the EU and India are asking themselves and here actually there would be I think um, a real benefit for real dialogue. India has reacted very cautiously and in fact uh, in a very uh, skeptical uh, and um, uh, way towards the BII initiative. Um, it is worried, uh, particularly because the BII is uh, started and, in fact, is still very much uh, uh, anchored also in the India, pa in the China-Pakistan relationship. India is very worried that it see that the BII is a power play for China to increase its power vis-a-vis -vis India, amongst other things. Now, that doesn't need to be the case necessarily. Um, and I think some of the content of the sessions yesterday showed that actually there perhaps isn't a grand plan 
for China behind BII. So where can we act? I think actually if we want BII again to benefit the entire world, and we'll come back to the issue of climate change because this huge infrastructural uh, gambit has a major impact on our ability to cope with climate change and not to worsen it, by the way. Um, I think by having a dialogue about BI and maybe getting India and uh, and uh, the U.S. partners with China on BI, actually, that could be one thing that could make India think again about the benefits and the threats coming from it. And we could perhaps actually diffuse tensions because we, I think I would agree that it, we'd not, we shouldn't go in the... Uh, in, the, in further directions of uh, zero-sum games where the rise of China is necessarily a threat to the other countries, including countries that see themselves as having a major role to play globally, like India, or institutions and organizations like the EU. So I think I'll stop there, uh, and I can elaborate on other perspectives, I think, for India-EU relations. Thank you very much, indeed. So, after those really four very interesting and deep considerations. Uh, we have the possibility now to take the floor, make questions. I immediately pick up the first one. Uh, we have uh, less than half an hour. I would like to give the possibility to all, all our four distinguished panelists to give a proper answer. So. Thank you very much, uh, Maciek Jastrzębiec. I work for the Commission in uh, Media Analysis. My question is about uh, ABC mentioned by, by Madame Islam. Uh, and I'm just thinking about Brexit and the constellation in Security Council. So I'm just thinking, how fast do you think that the place of UK in the Security Council will be challenged as a result of Brexit? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Tim Persons. I'm the Chief Scientist of the GAO, U.S. Government Accountability Office. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is just a question for uh, my friend Nicholas. I appreciate his comments on that, just following up on the DARPA idea for Europe. Um, DARPA is as much a culture as it is an institution, and it's a very high-risk, high-reward type environment. Uh, what's your sense of, of support for that kind of high-risk idea where no questions asked, strict meritocracy, that kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Monica Mendez from Mexico. And my question to the panel would it be regarding to global power. You haven't mentioned Latin America at all, for example, as some of the regions that were, from my point of view, the EU has historical um, relations with, with across, all across Latin America, because not only since the, um, the Hispanic conquer and the um, English one, but also uh, regarding in the uh, last century, well, there was a lot of migration from all the countries towards South America. And I would like to hear your thoughts regarding how the EU could reposition itself in this region, and also how, what kind of threats or do you foresee, uh, for example, with a radicalism both to the right, like in Brazil, and also to the left, like in Mexico. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, you know, to see from the council, I would like to uh, pose a question to uh, Mr. Maciej Popowski. Um, concerning the uh, role of the European Union worldwide and the neighborhood policy and stability, security, I think one of the great advantage of the last decades was the, the value of the EU transformative powers as a model. Um, do you see uh, anything that, uh, that might have been weakened in the last couple of years because of the divisions within the EU and also because of the problems the EU is also suffering? Just think about values and rule of law and democracies and all these things might have, um, as a consequence, all these developments uh, uh, weaken a little bit our uh, attractivity concerning transformative power. Uh, the uh, second quick question is, I found very interested in uh, Mr. Nicolas Mihaile uh, presentation and all these things concerning scaling of industrial revolutions and the competitiveness of the EU worldwide. In this respect, what I am thinking about is you mentioned that 
what we really need is the development of business models in the next uh, 10, 12 years to come. Uh, I would appreciate to learn more about it, how we could better build up or strengthen our business models. What should the EU do or the next commission, for example, should propose on that? So something more details concerning the direction of looking for solutions, because we see the trend, but what we need is solutions in the next couple of years to come. Thank you. My name is Carl Dolan. I'm the director of the Transparency International EU office. I have two questions, one for Shada, one for Nicholas. Uh, the question for Shada is, uh, in your opening remarks, do you think you were being a bit too optimistic? Because quite rightly, what you said is that uh, China and India and other countries have benefited from the old rules-based world order, and now the time has come to co-create a new world order. But of course, there are some countries, uh, let's call them petro-kleptocracies, who might be very happy to have that dog-eat-dog Hobbesian order that somebody referred to earlier. And so maybe in addition to the ABCs you mentioned, I could add uh, CDEs, which is corruption, disruption, and extraction, which uh, these countries are trying to promote. Um, the, the second uh, question is uh, to, um, yeah, it's to, to Nicholas. So uh, following on from the previous question, uh, you mentioned it's about achieving scale. And so does achieving scale in Europe mean going back to an older form of industrial policy uh, about picking national champions and picking winners, which actually might come into conflict with EU state aid rules. You talk about the global power. Mehmet Kanaji from Allied Command Transformation. You talk about global power, but you haven't defined it actually. Do you mean military, economy, technology, populations? I mean, give us some ideas. The second thing is we always talk about global power competition. Uh, from EU perspectives, in which areas that uh, the global power competition is going to be more important for EU, like the high north and Arctic, uh, Eastern Europe, Balkans, or North Africa? Thank you. Uh, Daniel Dresner, Tufts University. I heard a lot of uh, talk, uh, particularly from uh, Berenice, about the, the notion of resistance within the Pacific Rim of, of the Pence containment strategy on China. And I can certainly accept that as a, a possibility. I guess my question is, what would China have to do for that perspective to change, both within the Pacific Rim and, for that matter, within the European Union? Uh, I will give the floor first of all. Uh, we, we, will, we will follow the order that we had. So I will ask, I will ask Ms. Islam. Take the floor. Thank Thanks. you very much. I'm also going to just respond very quickly to what has been said on the panel. Uh, on the BRI, if I may, on the Belt and Road, I think China is really looking now uh, for ideas to multilateralize, because there's a real pushback from many, many countries across Asia and Africa to what China's original vision, if you like, was, which is basically a very fluid, opaque, you know, uh, everything goes kind of attitude. And it's, they're realizing very, very quickly that that doesn't fit in with many countries across the globe. And we've just seen it uh, uh, tragically in Pakistan, where the Chinese consulate was attacked by Baloch insurgents. I mean, this is something that people who watched the region saw coming, if I may say so. But of course, China did not, because China did not, because China doesn't engage with civil society, doesn't talk uh, to, to, to journalists. And they were pick, not picking up exactly what I said earlier, the, 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 the messages that were coming from civil society. So I think because we know we need a connectivity, we need infrastructure, I think the best thing we can do, and we've actually come up with it as Europeans, is this new blueprint for Europe-Asia connectivity. And I think if we use it intelligently, it can become a rule book for the kind of connectivity that we need, because we want sustainability, we want openness, transparency. And I think, from my talks with the Chinese just recently at our Europe-China Forum, that this time is right, because there, it, it's, we reached peak BRI, as someone mm -hmm. said. And you know, it's really now time to start looking for ideas, and they're in the, in, in the market for that. Mm, on uh, what much have said about, yes, we can adjust the global order a tiny little bit to accommodate the countries who are clamoring for a voice, I'm sorry, that's not just going to work. I know it's very easy to say, let's tweak this, let's tweak that, but that's not going to work. So I think we really need to be a bit more careful about the kind of language we use, because if we don't use an inclusive language, we're going to get a pushback. And BRI, in some ways, as the AIIB, is a pushback, saying, guys, if you don't give us a voice, 
uh, we'll do our own thing. And there is a real danger that if we don't work on BRI, the appellate system, the legal system, arbitration, that will be the Chinese way. And we really don't want that. So, uh, so I'd be ca careful about that. Um, and that exactly brings me to the point you raised about uh, Brexit and the Security Council. I think it's a very um, good question, but it would, I think, be very reluctantly that anyone would actually start talking about it now. Because if you do that, you open the question of the EU seat. Do you think any uh, European country at the moment would want to do that? You know, a big uh, can of worms. Uh, in Asia also, it brings Japan into the picture, India into the picture, and uh, however much they're all working together at the moment under Trump's sort of uh, watch, um, they, they, they're not ready for that. So I think that is a step too far. But if we are going to rejig the way things are, are, are going to be, that will come up over and over again. But as I understand it, the UN has left it for the moment. Um, your point uh, about uh, the petrol countries. Uh, I do agree. I think they, they would be more than happy for things to unravel. But my impression really from uh, India, China, Indonesia, Japan is that they won't let that happen because they see the value of what we have at the moment. They don't want this uh, dog eat dog world. They really don't want it. So, But once again, as I said, if we are not careful, that reality of you know this unraveling will become uh, a danger. It will then happen. So we really need to listen. And I think I think we're doing it now because I see that in the India strategy also. I see that in the in in how we're dealing with Japan. We're we're talking to the Australians, to the New Zealands. We've got um, Korea going. We've got discussions with ASEAN. So we're doing it. I just think our narrative, our power is not powerful enough. We really need to hit the headlines. And that I think we're not doing. We're not at the moment communicating properly because I, frankly, after years of watching this, I see the jigsaw falling into place as regards EU Asia strategy. I see all the elements there. Some, as I said, can be improved, but there are, it's, it's all there. It's all there in this little bag, you know, but we need to put it together. We need to make it more powerful and need to then market it in a more forceful manner uh, in, in Asia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Nicolas Mel, first yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, going in order, so, Timothy, you're totally right. DARPA is a cultural success, and it's a miracle that the success took root within the Department of Defense. And, and I said before that we Europeans need to work out a different arrangement because we cannot hide under national security as a collective imaginary to uh, foster uh, an environment where we let our taxpayer accept high risk, high reward, long-term patient capital. DARPA is a methodology that is able to go very nimbly about uh, going into a high, uh, I would say, magnitude program and stopping the program when it's not working. It's the entire bureaucracy. And, and for us to do that in Europe is very difficult. Why? Because the ways in which we have built our institutional triangle is on technocracy, is on bureaucracy. It's also a matter of pride. And so for us to move beyond bureaucracy in how we frame disruptive innovation, one. Second, do it in a transnational way. There is a reason why President Macron's speech at La Sorbonne calling for a European DARPA fell short. There are many reasons, one of which pertains to the fact that when you have to move beyond, move beyond bureaucracy, that too in a transnational way, you know, extend the hand to our German friends in a way that will move beyond the fair return rule, which stakes for taxpayers and, and workers which, which are big, it is hard to do. It is really hard to do. And, and that's why I think we need to, to uh, fall back onto collective imaginaries that unite our youth, our talent, techno-scientific talent on the continent, and ecology and uh, what we call the ecological transformation is one such imaginary around which we know we need a lot of investment, and we know we need a lot of talent, and we know there are a lot and there's a lot of employment at the very end of it. So that's, uh, that's, my, that's my answer to you. To the second question vis-a-vis -vis, uh, business model and scale. It's really, we have no shortage of business model innovation in Europe. We can and we have and we will continue to create such business models. The story of industrial scaling is a story of scaling 
these business models, not only technology, but these business models. Neither Facebook, nor Google, nor Uber invented anything originally. They innovated on top of publicly funded techno-scientific inventions. And they really percolated that change through society, through business model innovation, with a culture. The topography of power, when you go to the Silicon Valley, the topography of power, managerial power, across these offices is very, 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 very different from what we're having here uh, at a, a typical industrial house. It's much flatter. It's not flat, not at all. There is a topography, but it's flatter. Information circulates uh, very efficiently, top down, down, uh, bottom up, oblique. And the, 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 the story of scaling up from venture capitalism to growth, to private equity, and then uh, IPO, the stock market, is precisely scaling that culture. And this, that, this is why these two questions are connected. We need industrial capital so as to let our, business, our homegrown business models scale and play the role of soft power and be the denial values across the continent and across the world. And we can turn around this transatlantic alliance and percolate and penetrate into the uh, US market and bring these values. You know, AI applied to healthcare for cancerology is going potentially to create a fair price for privacy, obviously. Well, that's an opportunity for us. What do we do about that? So that's, that's my answer to you. And that connects me to the, to the third point over, yes, we shall not, and I hope we don't, reproduce the mistakes in the industrial policies of the past. Uh, picking up champions is something that is uh, chancy, that, can, that costs a lot to the taxpayer, to the consumer, and that yields mixed results. But I also want us to realize that we need to honor our history. And our history is an history, again, of building a transnational community where we need to move beyond the rule of fair return, where French, Germans, Spaniards, and Polish need to find a way to invest in common, R&D, taxpayer money, and accept not to see part of that money fall back into factories on their soil. And that's why we will continue to have to live with a less organic industrial policy than it should naturally, not naturally, that it should optimally be. And that's why we'll have to frame our own model where, like a bit Airbus for AI, we'll have to deal with some of these, uh, I would say, managerial, technocratic-driven industrial policy. We have to live with that, and we have to um, try and balance out some of the most toxic uh, impacts of these and, and let this industrial policy, despite that uh, disadvantage, become smarter. Not easy at all. Thank you, uh, Nicolas. So now, Mr. Massier Popowski, floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, pretty short answers and um, um, uh, one uh, brief remark or reaction. First, I mean, on the, uh, uh, I, I had, have a past in security and defense as well, so just uh, also to react on this point on, on DARPA, I mean, a European DARPA is not imminent, but we have to start moving into that direction. I, exactly because it would change the way we are dealing with defense policy in, in Europe. And that's the rationale behind the Commission proposal to set up a European defense fund as of 2021. I mean, there is a preliminary uh, uh, defense fund already in, in, in place, small, but it will grow. And, and this is a cultural revolution as well. I said it before that then, you know, that, that was very difficult to imagine and some people are really are very unhappy about the militarization of the EU budget. That's not the point. We are seeing an opportunity, there's a challenge, there's a technology, technology and capacity gap between Europe and the United States that we are not going to close in 10 years, but we have to start moving into that direction. Uh, how it's going to materialize in terms of uh, institution and institutional setup, I don't know yet. I know that there were many voices from this house, from the European Parliament, calling for, for, for setting up of a, a DG defense in the European Commission, for instance. I mean, it's not my call, uh, but, uh, but, you know, there is, a, there is a, there, a change is happening, and, and I think it's, it's going into a, a right direction. Whether it's going to produce a technological revolution, I don't know either. But certainly there is realization of a huge potential, including in the area of innovation of the, of the defense industry. It's fragmented. Um, the whole procurement system is well too complicated. So if you want to get the, the, the maximum um, um, output, we have, to be, we have to be more rational in, uh, in our defense spending. Powerful transformation, it's still there. 
But I agree that any centrifugal tendencies in Europe do weaken us. You know, we are living in an interconnected world. It's very banal when I say it. it sounds banal when I say it, but people watch us. So those whom we would like to repeat after us, I mean, to, to, you know, uh, to be transparent, to, to improve governance, uh, uh, because they want to become members of the European Union, they are watching us. So they are watching our divisions on migration policy or, for that matter, the ongoing dispute within the European Union on the application of the rule of law. Uh, it's not good. Um, but it's one more reason for us, the Commission, to be very principled. And, and, and so we call it the fundamentals first. So we are not going to go soft uh, on... on uh, the principles of the rule of law, independent judiciary, freedom of media, that's not going to change. Um, and the third question was about the, uh, where the competition with other powers is taking place. I would say pretty much everywhere, but of course, closer to home, it makes a difference. We are now watching the Balkans very closely because of the Western Balkan strategy and the accession perspective offered to the Western Balkan countries. And of course, we are not there alone. <laughs> Chinese are there, the Russians are there, the Gulf states are there. Uh, they do have their influence uh, to various extent, of course. Uh, um, it's not always possible to counter them, when we, when, but, but of course we have this power of attraction. So that's certainly our advantage. When we go a bit further away to Africa, for instance, there we are still the biggest provider of, of development assistance, but we do it, again, by the book whereas Chinese money is coming with no strings attached. Uh, but, important to stress, it's not, it's very rarely, if, if at all, development money. This is loans uh, or just investment uh, driven by a purely commercial logic, so it makes a difference. And just a reaction to Shada on the, uh, the improvement of the international system. I'm not saying that we, are, we, we, should, we should impose anything or to preach to the to the emerging powers or the powers that have emerged some time ago, uh, but they happen to be UN members. So you know our approach is very much UN centric. You may criticize the UN for for um, a lot of things, but you know there is for the time being that's the thing that we have. That's the only game in town. So let's try to improve wherever we can. And I know there are many many loose ends, and for instance the uh, the, the reform of the Security Council that has been sort of left hanging. Thank you very much indeed. So, Berenice, Ms. Aguio, you have your five minutes. Um, well, I'll take um, Professor Drasner's question on um, what would China have to do for this uh, let's avoid a containment mindset to change. Um, I think it's, um, it depends where you, it's a very important question, very difficult one, but um, it depends which part of the world you're looking at. Um, it's interesting that um, when you look at the, the South China Sea, uh, where China is clearly on the offensive, in, including in terms of hard power in military ways, um, which threaten actually, um, to some extent, uh, the livelihood on important constituencies in countries like the Philippines uh, and Vietnam, you know, there is still a sort of a pushback against containment. So I think it would take a lot, for one thing, because there's... Um, there's a sense, I think, when you're that we would be losers anyway in terms of because we would be first in line, um, and these countries have been historically first, you know, uh, where where the Cold War was hot, so they remember exactly um, what it feels like to be caught between two uh, two um, two big powers um, and uh, to be embroiled in in blocks. Um, for India, I think. That's a bit different. Uh, and I think what could change the picture is whether India itself feels at some point that it, it is increasingly contained by China itself. And here there's a sort of a, what we call a security dilemma, right? Um, both in um, China, uh, I think, has a deep historical sense themselves of being surrounded and of threats that can come from all directions. India, it's a bit more recent, but um, it is particularly worried uh, about not just the Himalayas, which is where the, historically the, the clash with China has been, but also right now about the Indian Ocean. And um, the idea that China is building what is sometimes called as a string of pearls around India uh, by fostering ties with Sri Lanka um, and also deepening its ties with uh, its uh, 
its uh, all-weather friend, so-called all-weather friend uh, Pakistan, um, is deeply worrying for India. Now, I actually don't think necessarily that there's such a string of pearl strategy. India has a huge advantage still in the Indian Ocean over China, but it's, it's about perceptions, right? And I think the string of pearl stra strategy is perceived as something that China is doing that could potentially make India feel like the only way it can break out is maybe not by contempt, but by strong alliances. Um, another way of thinking about this uh, is to think about, again, where, when, what is the time in history that India came closest after independence to allying itself with one of the superpowers of the time? It was in the 70s, uh, late 60s and 70s, India coming closer to the Soviet Union uh, because it was afraid uh, of China uh, after the 1962 war, and he was afraid of the reaction of the United States after the independence of Bangladesh. And even then, it still wasn't a real alliance. It was a very close ties uh, economically that made India um, uh, struggle in terms of breaking out then of the Cold War and economically, but it still wasn't an actual alliance, even then. Um, and so, you know, there is a possibility that India might decide to go out more strongly against China, but containment, I think that it would take a lot to change that Indian mindset. Um, I think there was a question um, about power, which was left unanswered in a way because it's a really difficult question, and I actually give an entire lecture to my students. I make them suffer through an hour of discussing the different ways in which we can think of, of power. But, um, and, you know, we can think, of course, of military uh, economic power, uh, normative power, which all three things are very much on the minds of the EU. But I think we can also think about this, um, if I can be theoretical for a second, in terms of two things. Power from, which is autonomy and freedom from the actions of others that could pressure us to do things we do not want to do, that we don't consider good for ourselves. And here the EU has to think very strongly about how it can do so vis-a-vis -vis China, but actually here it's really about the US, I would say, if you look at what's happening with Iran. Um, and it's power too, so power to effect change, to influence other people. And here we can think certainly of military power, of economic power, of soft power, of cultural power. And stopping the theoretical um, chapter to go back to what this means um, concretely, I think here there's also something that India, uh, the EU, uh, really needs to focus on if it wants to build a partnership with India, and maybe it's a case for other parts of the world, including Latin America. In, the EU needs to work on its visibility in India and other countries in the region and elsewhere. It has very little visibility, very little. In fact, if you even look, uh, just looking at the, the announcement made, uh, for a new strategy of India just last week. Um, there is a, there is a um, snapshot, what is the EU doing with India? Um, 1.2 million direct employment created, 5 million indirect employments created. That's nothing in a country of 1.3 billion people. 50,000 students coming from India to the EU per year. That is nothing. Australia, 22 million people does better Right? So what does it take from the EU to be more attractive, to be seen, to be actually visible, to be in the, the consciousness of people? And people are paying attention. One thing that you recognize when you go spend time in India, and I would say um, in South Asia, is people know nothing about the EU. They know nothing, they, in fact, they know nothing about, they really know very little about France or individual countries. They might know a few things about the UK, but their eyes are set on the US and on China, and the EU is nowhere to be seen. And to a large extent, I would say, that's still an issue for, at the policy level as well. So one of the key things that the EU will need to do, and I would suggest uh, perhaps for other regions as well, that it needs to apply this more broadly, but certainly for India, the EU needs to have a real visibility strategy because that's where this power to do things starts. Thank you. Time is perfect. I want really to thank all of you for your brilliant interventions. Thank you to all of you for your constructive and brilliant debate. I only regret that I wanted to use this one for stopping, but I, I will do it for close the meeting.